So thank you for showing up this morning. Uh, I do direct advanced analysis applications. We consult in risk assessment and designing robust, cost-effective risk mitigation measures. Our parent company, if you see on the program, it says JMARC Services. That's our parent company, and they train uh, military intelligence officers, both U.S. and our allies, in critical thinking and risk assessment. And uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about preparing for, anticipating, and not getting destroyed by black swan threats. Uh, black swan, as most of you know, is a major, unexpected, huge impact event that is usually very disastrous for most people, especially if you're unprepared. Uh, black swans are considered unpredictable. I'm going to argue with that during my presentation today. If you're looking for them, you can anticipate them and you can prepare for them. And not only can you avoid a lot of the damage, as you'll see hedge funds and other companies, they do anticipate them, they prepare for them, and they make a lot of money doing it. So that's what I'm going to go over today is best practices in identifying and preparing for black swan threats so they don't hurt your company and you might not be able to profit from them. I hate it when I go to a conference and someone speaks for an hour and I've got like no notes and there was maybe five minutes of useful information for me. So I take the other approach. I usually unload several hours of information in 50 minutes and that's what you're going to do today. So it's going to be like drinking from a fire hydrant for you. You're going to get a ton of information. You are not going to be able to keep up with me on the slides, but that doesn't matter because you've got paper copies of them. If you email me, our printed copies you can get. If you email me, I will send you the color versions of the slides as well. I'm going to highlight in words what the really key points are and give you some additional information and a lot of news you can use you're going to get out of this. I am an Air Force Academy graduate. I went to uh, Harvard University upon graduation, got an academic scholarship there. I got a master's degree and PhD in operations research. You might guess I was on the debate team at the Air Force Academy. I can talk really fast, but no matter how fast I talk, you can listen faster. So you're going to be able to keep up with me and follow me, even though we go very quickly through this. Most of my career is not in the military. It's in the Guard and Reserve. And most of my career was in business. I was at ConAgra, a big agribusiness company. Uh, I was in financial planning companies, management consulting, and I've done most of my work in risk assessment. I have to tell you that I think the best training I've had in risk assessment uh, is not from the traditional training you've been through, but through mergers and acquisitions. When I go out and do a due diligence review of a company we're looking at acquiring, I have to know every possible risk that might befall you. And I generally find that when we're done our due diligence assessment of a company, we know more about their vulnerabilities than they do. Now, if they've got someone like you on their stat, that's not the case. But for the past 20, 30 years, there weren't a lot of people like you out there in the workforce. Most companies weren't really well prepared for identifying risks. And we did do that. So we are very good doing business due diligence. My company, Advanced Analysis Application, draws some lessons from the intelligence community, from due diligence and mergers and acquisition and business practices. But we also use a lot of information and best practices from a man named Nassim Taleb, who's the author of The Black Swan and the book Anti-Fragile. And I'm going to spend some time talking about his book. It is without doubt the most valuable, important book I have ever read in my life. If you're in your business you're in today and you haven't read this book, you've made a mistake already. Because we make all kinds of mistakes that make us, as Nassim Taleb puts it, suckers for black swan risk. You are born with inherent ways of thinking that make you vulnerable to black swan risk. And then worse, when you go to school and you get advanced training, you are taught a lot of bad techniques that make you vulnerable to black swan risk. One of them I've seen throughout this conference, we're going to talk about in a slide later today, the standard risk assessment matrix is a disaster for black swan risk preparation, as we'll talk about here shortly. So it's a great book, but unfortunately, um, he uses some terminology that really is not the best. He says that black swans are unpredictable. Well, actually, they're not. You can anticipate that they're going to come, and you should prepare for them. What you can't do is calculate a probability that the odds of a pandemic happening next year are 15%. I can't do that unless I'm a terrorist and I know I'm going to launch one next year. Uh, you can't do that. So because of that, most people take the really bad approach of assuming they're not going to happen, and that's where we get into huge trouble. Black swans are largely in unpredictable, but they can be foreseeable. You can anticipate them, and you can use expert assessment, very critical analysis, which is what we do training and consulting in, so that you're prepared for them, you're anticipating them, and you're getting to where your organization won't 
fail from them. Now, his book, The Black Sun, I got to warn you, it's not an easy read. He's a philosopher. He wanders around. He insults almost every profession there is, except for military. He likes the military, which is good. Uh, but a lot of people don't like the book because it's hard to read, and he's just a pretty insulting person. If you email me, and my email address is on the bottom of all slides, I will send you my Cliff's Notes on the Black Swan. I've typed up the best parts of the book. Page number is there for you. If you email me, I'll send you my Cliff's Notes of the books that covers really the key points and the information you need to, to use from it. I'm going to do for you a case study over the next probably 30 minutes on a very predictable, foreseeable black swan disaster that's coming, and that's bioengineered viral pandemics. The experts that talk about it use the I word, inevitable. It is inevitable we are going to have a pandemic. The question is, is a natural pandemic going to get us first? Is it going to be an accidental pandemic that comes from a lab release? We've already had lab accidents doing bio research where they've created deadly viruses. Fortunately, they haven't got out. Or is it going to be even worse, a terrorist, or worse yet, a nation state like Iran or Korea developing a virus and then releasing it over here uh, to wipe us out? And we're going to have some slides about it. Dr. Kurzweil is up here in this slide. He's probably one of the most brilliant scientists of our era. Um, when he wrote this, made this statement here, warning about bioengineering being worse than a nuclear war, the, the plague that's going to come, the, the, the pandemic. He was with the U.S. Army Scientific Advisor Group when he wrote that. He's currently the chief of technology for Google. And there are all kinds of experts. You've got backup slides of them telling you that this is coming. Now, Despite all these experts telling you this, it's not in the media. And even when it is in the media, and it occasionally is, most people ignore it. What you see on the bottom of the slide there is an example in 2011 where the media did cover bioengineering because some scientists were about to publish an article that explains how you take avian flu, which currently, if you get it, uh, it's 60% chance it's going to kill you. But it's not human-to-human -human transmissible yet. But it's going to become that way. And these scientists developed a way in their lab to make it transmissible. In this case, it was ferrets, but they're a mammal. And theoretically, if they've got this virus that can infect ferrets through the air, human, human transmissible virus can be developed from that. And you're going to have a huge disaster on your hand, worse probably than anything we've experienced in the history of mankind. So they're going to publish this in the article, and the federal government said, no, we, we don't really want you to do that, to publish it. They actually delayed the publication. It did get published. And the argument they used was that, look, people already know how to do this. This is not new technology. And the article did get published. It's out there. I don't think they should have published it because it makes it easier for terrorist groups and lunatics to find it. But it has been published. I read it. I know how to do it. And the really bad thing about that methodology they talked to you about is it's not a high-tech approach. It's not fancy DNA manipulation. We'll talk about that later. This is a crude way, basically stuffing avian flu virus from dead birds up the noses of ferrets and waiting until it mutates into something that goes through the air. A low-tech way to do it. Uh, but the news just keeps getting worse. What's really bad about bioengineering is it doesn't take an al-Qaeda. You don't need a terrorist group. You don't need a big budget to do bioengineering to make ferret avian flu into a human-human transmissible form, or even worse, to take smallpox in a lab using the advanced technology uh, to release it. So it's been warned about. Think tanks, I've worked at think tanks, the Department of Defense and DHS and scientists, Johns Hopkins, all kinds of people have been warning for 10 plus years now that you got to be careful. This biotechnology is going to be used by bad people to cause a virus, but not a lot of people are paying attention to it. This is another warning from another think tank, the Brookings Institute, probably the, one of the most respected think tanks in the world. Again, describing how one single person can develop a virus and then release it to cause a pandemic. In 2010, uh, it was an important year because in 2010, for the first time in history, they actually created life completely from scratch using this advanced DNA technology. Created a new life form, not by modifying some other thing, but by just in a lab, plugging together the DNA to create a new life form. And the technology advances just keep coming, and this is the worry about it. This is a quote from the Homeland Security Newswire. Quote, eventually it will almost certainly be possible to recreate bacterial pathogens like smallpox. We might also be able to enhance these pathogens. 
Some work in Australia on mouse pox suggests ways of making smallpox more potent, for example. In theory, entirely new pathogens could be created. In 2001, there was an accident in Australia in a lab. They were trying to make a good virus variant to control um, with them. They worked with the mousepox virus, and they did a small genetic manipulation trying to do good. They accidentally created a lethal virus, wiped out their lab population. It didn't get out, but the problem, as you'll see, is there's a lot of other accidents that happen where it could get out. So there's also a chance of accidental releases of viruses occurring. And the technology just keeps advances. Those examples I gave you are like five years ago. Technology is improving all the time. This is from 2016. This is a technology called CRISPR. It's been featured in quite a few magazines talking about the good part. People ignore the bad part at the bottom. It could really get out of hand. Yeah, it could really get out of hand. All it takes is a terrorist to take CRISPR and take avian flu and modify it to make it human to human transmissible, and we're in trouble. And that is going to happen. If you go to the backup slides that I give you, uh, I've got a list of 13 different sources talking about pandemics, and most of them use the word inevitable. This is going to happen. A lot of people were afraid about Ebola a year or so ago, but Ebola really is not a pandemic threat. Uh, it's lethal, but it's very low transmissibility. And when you get Ebola, you're almost instantly showing symptoms and sick, so you're not walking around spreading it. Compare that to smallpox. With smallpox, highly transmissible, and you can have smallpox for several days. Uh, your neighbor right now could have smallpox if he had it. He's contagious, you're catching it. He doesn't know he's got it, he doesn't know he's spreading it. Those are really bad. So avian influenza, we don't know what the lethality rate would be for the human human transmissible form. If you get it now directly from a bird, it's like you know Ebola levels of lethality, 60%. It's gonna probably be lower when it mutates naturally or when someone manipulates it in the lab, but still it's going to be potentially a very high lethality rate. If it goes down to a 2% lethality, well maybe that doesn't sound that bad. That's what the lethality was in the 1918 Spanish flu. It was only a 2% lethal uh, pandemic, but it killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide, and that was back then. Nowadays, you'd have casualties much, much higher than that because there's not just so many people, but we're so more crowded and there's so much more international travel. Uh, we're not an agrarian society like we used to be. So if things get worse and someone is really, really good, here I am probably talking about not an individual unless they're a biology expert, but if a terrorist group or Iran or Korea, if they've got a bioweapons program and the answer is yes, they do, or just don't know what they're doing, this is unclassified information. If you Google on the web, you can find out where the intelligence community assesses people have biological weapons programs. And if they start bioengineering and creating a virus, they could potentially have something with huge lethality, huge transmissibility, and the ability for people to be spreading it for days without noticing it. And I'm going to give you an example of that later on. So if you want a weapon to kill Americans, there is absolutely nothing better than this. Because not only can you make a very low-cost, lethal weapon, but you can release it over here, not in your country. And before you release it, if you're really concerned, develop a vaccine. Develop a vaccine that you stockpile for your people, you release it over here by the time it comes back to Iran or Korea or wherever you are, although not a lot of people travel into Korea, it's not too hard to keep them away. Uh, you've got the fantastic weapon to destroy the United States and there are a lot of people who would like to do that. It could be your neighbor that is developing this virus. I'm not making any of this up. If you Google DIY bio, do-it-yourself bio, it's a website, it's out there, and it's where your neighbor and others could be out there experimenting with DNA manipulation technology, developing a virus in their lab. Now, hopefully it's some dad who's trying to do research to help his daughter who's got some disease and find some cure, but it could also be people who are just biohackers or doing this for fun just to see what they can do, or it could be they're a jihadi terrorist uh, next door to you doing that. So the ability to manipulate DNA technology through high-tech methodology or just do the low-tech stuff, avian flu up ferret noses and see what comes out of that, you have to assume that a lot of terrorists, a lot of lunatics, a lot of nation states are doing it. I read articles from biologists, and I remember once I was reading from this lady, highly respected lady, please don't try to look her up, uh, but she used the phrase in her article, mammalian weeds, referring to human population. 
mammalian weeds. We're mammals. So you think about it. There are a lot of people who are very concerned about the environment. What's the major destructive factor in the environment? We are. There's too many of us. So I could very well understand an environmentalist, a biologist with tremendous uh, intellectual power coming to the conclusion that I have got to set the human overpopulation back. I'm going to develop and release the virus to do it because it's the only way to save the trees and protect our endangered species. You can come up with hundreds of cases of how someone might do this. So it is inevitable. We are going to have a pandemic. People say we're overdue for a natural pandemic. And it is very, very feasible for bad guys down to your next door neighbor to design one and release it on their own. So there should be no doubt about it that's going to happen. Even Taleb warned about uh, the great plague to come that's going to dominate the planet. He gets a lot of publicity, but that hasn't gotten him a lot of publicity. So let's look at how bad it might be if a nation state like Iran wanted to develop and release the virus. So in my assumption here, I'm assuming Iran's developed a virus and they're releasing it. Well, why would they do that? Iran, as you know, is developing nuclear weapons. Supposedly now they're not, they still are. But what good is a nuclear weapon for Iran if they do succeed? It helps their prestige, but they're going to launch one nuclear weapon on Iran. They probably couldn't even reach the United States. First of all, when they got to the point where they're ready to launch, either the United States or Israel is going to blow the damn thing up. They're not going to let them launch. But even if they did succeed in launching it, they could damage Israel, maybe damage us, but you're not going to destroy us with a nuclear weapon. And what are we going to do in return? We're going to blow the you-know-what out of Iran. It's not a good move. So maybe 30 guys in some Iranian Revolutionary Guard cell gets together and figures out, you know, this is asinine. We want to kill the great Satan. Does anyone know who the great Satan is? You're the great Satan. We're the great Satan. So we want to kill the great Satan. The best way to do it is, look at this article we read. All you got to do is stuff avian flu up. Ferret knows you develop a lethal virus. You go over to the United States and you release it. So in my scenario here, I've got 30 marauder jihadi volunteers to do this. And they've got a virus that's highly lethal. The lethality doesn't matter in this case. But what they've got is they've got a virus that for four days, I can release it. I'm contagious, but I'm not symptomatic. So I can walk around. So they go around airports and train stations, and they're releasing this virus. And at the end of, after the first day, they've exposed it to other people. Now for days two, three, and four, those people are now running around releasing the virus, only they don't know it. So at the end of this four-day period with just 30 people in, in 15 teams, by the end of that period, I've got almost 6 million infected Americans. And they'll be in every single state and probably every city. So at that point, quarantine isn't going to do you any good. Now let's assume that immediately the CDC detects the virus, so we're immediately issuing warnings and people are you know, trying to reduce social contact. It doesn't matter. You've already got a pandemic. You're not going to be able to control. Quarantine won't stop it. So in this kind of a case, uh, you have succeeded in bringing economic activity to a halt, and you've dealt a huge blow against the United States. It could last for years. The movie Contagion, if you didn't see it, it's actually it's a really good representation. In this case, it's a natural pandemic that develops. But it's a pretty good movie at showing that. The terms collapse I've just used, a lot of people use the terms existential threat when they talk about pandemics. They're defined on this slide. And if you really want to understand it, again, I recommend the movie Contagion because you know, it's centered on the Center for Disease Control. It was realistic. It was not overblown Hollywood, you know, zombie stuff running around. And they did a really good job of showing you how there's going to be a breakdown in law and order. You know, that has to be taken as a given. I'm going to give you a lot more examples of that coming. But it's going to take, at best, six months to develop a vaccine. Once we detect the virus, it's going to take you six months to develop. And now you start production. You don't have production for everyone. So at that point, and you see it in the movie, well, the government now has to start distributing the vaccine. They're going to prioritize. Well, law enforcement, hospital health care workers, Government officials are going to be high on that list. And a lot of people are going to say, no way. <laughs> I want my vaccine now, thank you. Uh, we have food deliveries that are going to run out long before then. If you're a food truck driver and there's a pandemic going on, do you want to be out driving your food truck and delivering your service for your measly pay? Probably not. Uh, one, there's a good chance you'll get the virus. But the other thing is there's a good chance you're going to get robbed, especially if you've got food on your label as you're pulling up to the store. The average grocery store in a city has how many days supply of food? Does anyone know? Three days. How long do you think that'll last? 
it will last an hour or two. Because <laughs> as soon as the news is out, everyone's going to descend on that store. You know, hopefully they'll be buying. Some people will soon start looting. Food's going to be gone in hours. And you're not going to get more in. And, you know, things are really bad. You're going to trash you in the store as well. If I'm an employee at that store, I'm not going back to work. My wife's a pharmacist. I can tell you now when there is a pandemic situation, she's not going to work. I don't want to be in a pharmacy or a food store during a pandemic situation. And people are going to figure this out real, real fast. So truck drivers are going to stop food deliveries. So a lot of people are going to be out of food from day one, and it's not going to be coming in for a long period of time. And if things keep getting worse, do you think the media is going to cooperate and tell them, oh, just calm down, it's okay? Or do you think the media and rumors will be exciting people to even more violence? Uh, there's examples from Katrina and elsewhere to tell you about that that we're going to go through here. Before we get into that, I want to talk about how vulnerable our economy is. And you all as an audience know this. We're a just-in-time delivery economy. We are highly, highly dependent on those food truck drivers and our daily deliveries we don't maintain big inventories. In that chart there, what I did is I compared our resilience and the fragility of our economy to what we used to be a century ago when we were more of an agrarian economy and what we are today. And we are, it's night and day difference. Our food is not local, our water is not local. Even our water in a big city comes in from quite some distance to get there. We don't have much food on hand. People used to can and garden and have a lot of food supplies. You don't have that anymore. Um, electric dependence, you know, people go crazy if they've lost electricity for a day. In 1977, I'll talk about this more later, New York City had a lightning strike, which will do a power outage in New York City for one day. We'll talk about the sticks later. It was one of the worst days of violence in New York City history. Looting, arson, all kinds of violence broke out. Uh, we're highly dependent on electricity. You saw that after Katrina and some other things as well. And then the inventory levels, the food we've already talked about, but even production companies, you know, unless you have rare earths where people have learned that you, know, you need to maintain a stockpile, uh, most people aren't going to be operating because they won't have deliveries and they won't go. So there's a good chance that our economy is going to cease operations very quickly if there's a pandemic or another event, like an EMP event that takes out our electricity and our electrical system. But there's also going to be loss of law and order. You saw this in a lot of cases. Let's go through Katrina first. Looting started in Katrina immediately after it. Now, Katrina was not a high threat disaster. It was warned about. They told you it was coming. And, and you know, there was water in the street. It wasn't 20 feet of water. There was several feet of water in flooded areas. It was really not a life-threatening situation from the disaster. It was a life-threatening situation if you were trying to be a store owner stopping looters uh, from coming in your store. Also, insights into police performance during Katrina. One third of the New Orleans police force deserted before the hurricane even hit. Some of the police force were involved in looting and stealing cars during Katrina. So you have to assume in a bad situation, you're going to have loss of law and order. In Katrina, we mobilized guard members from most states in the Union. Federal troops as well were sent into Katrina. Truck drivers, some of them refused to go into Katrina unless they had military escort. Well, if there's a pandemic, if there's a new Madrid earthquake that affects half, you know, the midsection of the country, you're not going to be able to bring in troops from other states. They're going to be in their home protecting it. You're not going to have a lot of law enforcement and military forces to keep law and order. How many of you, a quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with what happened in the United Kingdom in 2011 with their riots? Is anyone familiar with what happened there? You all should be. It's something out of study. I'm going to describe it briefly in this slide. And uh, you really ought to look into what happened there. This is a fascinating event because this is a disaster in lawlessness and looting that had, anyone want to guess what the cause was? There was no cause. There was no cause. It was not a soccer game. That'd normally be a good guess. I'll have some other examples. That, there was no cause. It's just for some reason in a part of London on one night, some kids started attacking a policeman, and then it spread to looting of stores, and people were robbed on the streets, and then it started spreading to other cities. There was no cause for it. And at the end of that day, the next day when people got up, they said, what in the hell was that? What happened last night? What was it? It was just incredible. And then something more amazing happened, because that night, it happened again for the second night and spread to more cities in the United Kingdom. And it just kept spreading, and there was no underlying cause. Here's some statistics on what happened, because this is really important for you to understand. 
Again, it started in London. It eventually spread to 22 out of 23 boroughs in London. But it went to other cities across England. Hundreds of youths in Manchester looted shops and set fires to cars and buildings. Police cars and five police stations were attacked in Nottingham. Police stations were attacked. Uh, people were shot in their stores trying to defend them. People were robbed in their cars. 2,500 shops and businesses were looted across England. 4,000 people were arrested, but an estimated 14,000 people were believed to have been involved in the looting and the arson and the attacks on police, and there was no cause of this. There are a lot of bad people out there. There's more every year, and with social media, with phone calls, people can organize very quickly and come out and take advantage of bad situations to raise hell. The risk of a collapse situation, both a loss of economic activity and a rise in lawlessness, is driven by these six trends, and it's just going to keep getting worse for us. There are new technologies. We talked about a few of them, and there are many more, like nanotechnology, that we don't have time to get into. There's more overpopulation, more urban areas. Our economy is very, very fragile and independent. We're dependent on these long-distance food shipments and just-in-time deliveries. And there's a lot less personal resilience. We used to be a nation of farmers you know, and pioneers. We're a nation of people who can't go you know, without a day without electricity, or we think we're under tremendous stress. You saw yesterday, you know, we turn our clocks back an hour and we're under a lot of stress. And there's just a lot more bad people. Uh, the statistics on gangs are, are pretty amazing. Uh, there are at least 30,000 gangs and 800,000 gang members in the United States at least. There's probably a lot more that we don't know about. That was the latest estimate. And they're from all over the world. They're local gangs. So the picture here is of MS-13. It's a particularly violent Latino gang uh, that does a lot of really violent killings. And you know, when you look at all these trends and you combine them, three big conclusions jump out of you and you need to, you need to really deal with them as a disaster planner. First of all, you should never assume the continued operation of the economy and maintenance of law and order. If there's a big disaster, even if the disaster doesn't cause destruction, bad people will pile onto it and loot. You saw it in Baltimore last year and will take advantage of it. And if it's really widespread, and really severe, you need to expect that there's going to be the economy shutting down, businesses aren't going to be operating, people are going to stay home to try to be safe. You should also assume that in a really bad disaster, you're on your own for security and assistance. You can't rely on the local sheriff and police force to be there for you. And the third thing you ought to realize is that it's not just the trigger event that matters. You know, our plans tend to be focused on hurricanes and a pandemic and these kinds of things, but you also have to be worried about the aftermath of it, the collapse impacts, and you have to have plans to deal with that. And when one disaster hits, you also have to be aware that they're not independent events. There's a good chance that one disaster is going to trigger another. So solar flares, for example, this has happened throughout history, and when they happen, they can destroy electronic systems and you have an electromagnetic pulse effect. One nuclear weapon that detonates over the United States can have a similar effect. It can destroy computer chips and take out electrical systems. So when that happens, other things can start to fail. Nuclear power plants do need nuclear, do need electricity from other sources to operate and shut down properly. Now they've got backup generators, I wonder if all their backup generators are EMP hardened so that if there's a nuclear weapon that explodes and it could be low yield, but if it's at high altitude that destroys computer chips, uh, is that reactor, is that generator going to keep functioning for the reactor? If it's a pandemic out there, are you sure that the nuclear power plant operators are going to be coming to work? If there's a loss of law and order from any type, it could be an economic collapse uh, that leads to wide protests and looting and loss of law and order, are nuclear power plant operators going to come to work? Uh, in those kinds of situations. So cascading effects can occur. If you doubt that, you know, just think about Fukushima. Earthquake causes a tsunami, causes a nuclear power plant accident. So you have to consider that. And again, the other thing you have to consider is that bad people and bad countries are gonna pile on. If we have a New Madrid incident in the United States, a big earthquake in the central section of the country, we're gonna call out all of our National Guard and our federal troops are gonna be involved as well. So if China wants to take Taiwan or Russia wants the Baltic states back, people wanna make trouble anywhere in the world, this is a good time to pile on. And those kinds of things are gonna happen. 
So again, Katrina was not a high threat scenario or disaster, and yet it caused tremendous losses. I mentioned New York City earlier in 1977 uh, with their disaster. There's some statistics on that there. And again, it's not just looting. People do arson. They attack police. They do really, really bad things. Uh, so there's a loss in law and order. So if you think someone's going to protect your store or your factory or your office building during a period of lawlessness, you know, it's probably not going to happen. There was a plague outbreak in Surat, India in 1994, another kind of interesting little case study. Plague is really not that bad. You can treat it with antibiotics. It's not really that contagious. But as soon as the news was announced, international airlines shut down, India was cut off, and in this one little, no, little for India, one little city of Surat, India, 600,000 people immediately took to the road to flee the city, one-fourth of the population. Only 53 people died, but it created absolute panic. Uh, from a relatively minor disease. Again, when a pandemic comes that really is lethal and contagious, where you do have good reason to concern, you have to assume that people everywhere are just going to be going hysteric over it. We did a tabletop exercise, we being the federal government, called Dark Winter. This was, this was over a decade ago. Uh, Senator Sam Nunn, who's one of the most respected senators we've ever had, he's long since retired, played the President of the United States in the exercise. And this was, a, this was, this was um, testing a tabletop exercise for a very small, limited smallpox uh, epidemic. And the exercise got shut down quickly after they got into it because when the government does exercises, not the military so much, but I've been, I was a county commissioner also done some part-time government service, you know. And when we do exercises, probably the same way in your company, you like to have them successful. You know, it's a tough challenge, but you rally, you overcome the threat, and you always win. Well, we didn't win in dark winter. Even though it was a fairly localized smallpox epidemic, it kept expanding. The players were doing things that they hadn't anticipated, didn't like, like closing borders, which makes it hard for a federal response to come in. And it ended up being so bad they kind of just eventually called it off. Uh, but lessons learned about this leaked out. Senator Nunn spoke about it, and his statements up there are very, very important. You have to assume this is going to happen. We're going to have biological attacks. And Notice who the threat is. The threat, once a virus occurs, could be your neighbor. It's otherwise normal people, you know, I mentioned gang members, but even normal people, uh, when they're worried about starving to death or catching a virus or armed people running around uh, shooting them, um, they're going to take action to protect themselves and things can get real bad real fast. So who is in charge of our pandemic preparation for the government? It's not the Department of Defense. It's not even Department of Homeland Security. Pandemic threats fall into the Department of Health and Human Services. This is a website picture I just took before this conference. And notice their recent testimony. It's from 2004. They don't pay a lot of attention at DHS to pandemics. They did a couple of years ago, and we're going to talk about that, but they don't care about it a whole lot now. Part of it is because of that effort a couple of years ago where they warned about a possible flying flu pandemic. It didn't happen, and they got kind of beat up over that, crying wolf and wasting money. I disagree with that, but they were criticized for it. The federal government, I'm emphasizing to you, and I should mention I served in the senior executive service at the top ranks of the civil service in the Department of Defense. You know, I've got a lot of experience in government. I'm telling you, don't count on them. Not because there's a conspiracy. They're very good people. The problem is they have to be politically correct. Uh, they have to stay in guidelines, and they're not allowed to scare people. So they can't give you fair warnings. And they're really not big on this. Also, biotechnology, who's promoting biotechnology in the federal government? It's the Department of Health and Human Services. So they don't want people to be scared about biotechnology. And 99.9% you know, .9 of biotechnology developments are great. They're going to do wonderful things for us. But the 0.1% the misuse of it could end up killing most of us. But they're not going to talk about that, as we'll see in some other things. They want people to be calm and they're not big on it. Notice the recommendation there, at least a three-day supply of food and water. People, that is absolutely bunk. If you think the three days of food and water is good preparation for a pandemic, you're out of your mind. Pandemics can last for a year. We've also done the example of you know, food stores, there's gonna be food gone immediately. Uh, Electricity is probably going to go, so some of your food supply is in the freezer. You know, enjoy that over the next week. But it could be months where there's no food shipments in big cities in a bad pandemic if it's nationwide. If there's a new Madrid earthquake that disrupts transportation and then lawlessness results, it could be long, long periods of time. Three days is a joke. 
but it's a good example to show you that you cannot count on federal government guidelines to be realistic. They're politically correct, and I can give you a lot more examples about that. Um, but actually, I, I should mention, I've got a backup slide. The second backup slide you got, it lists actually 15 specific reasons why the federal government is not going to give you a good warning of a threat, and they're not going to tell you good preparations for them because they don't want to harm you. I'll give you one more quick example. If you really want to be prepared for a threat besides food and water, what else do you need? Say it. Go ahead. You're not government officials. You need guns and ammo if you're going to be prepared from a disaster. Can you imagine someone in the Obama administration coming out with a recommendation saying, we encourage every citizen to have guns and ammo in their home? Uh-uh, it isn't going to happen. It's just too politically incorrect. And there's more issues. I mentioned the vaccine. We're going to start producing it in six months. Most of you aren't going to get it. Uh, it's just, it's a host of really messy, controversial subjects, the federal government doesn't want to talk about it. And by the way, there's no money in it. There's no defense weapon system where there's manufacturers backing it, and I get to, as a congressman, I get pork for my district. I get none of that. Uh, so the government isn't going to encourage preparations. You're going to have to do this on your own. This is a list here describing the type of virus, the death rate, the lethality, and some different casualty figures for a bunch of different situations, starting with the 1918, our last big pandemic. Then we get into an average seasonal flu, which you know doesn't kill a lot of people. That 2006 National Strategic Plan, the government started in 2006 to do an avian flu pandemic, and I applaud them for that, but they never went on with it. This got started in 2006. You can find it on the web. It eventually died out because it was too controversial. Look at the casualties. Up to 2 million people, that was not acceptable. That got shut down. The 2006 pandemic never came out. So what they came out with was this next one, this mild version. They got rid of avian flu because avian flu is going to be an absolute disaster if it's human to human transmissible. So they went back to a milder form of flu. And look at the casualties now. You know, it's like bad seasonal flu. It's not a bad pandemic, but that's what they want. They don't want people to get alarmed. If you've got a potentially human transmissible human flu, avian flu that's on the far side, it's going to kill millions to billions. It's going to shut down economic activity for a long period of time. It's going to last for more than a year. 1918 lasted more than a year. We're more dependent and vulnerable nowadays. We have a lot more bad people. A collapse situation is going to last for a long time. There are a lot of other threats I can't talk about in our limited time, but this may highlight just a few of them. Nuclear weapons is one. You know, if you ask people now, they say, oh, we don't have to worry about that. The Cold War's over. Everything's good. There's nine nu nations now that have nuclear weapons. Uh, Iran will make it number 10. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. I mean, what a, it's hard to find a less reliable, more unstable, dangerous country than Pakistan. Uh, Korea has nuclear weapons, North Korea. And it's going to get worse. A lot of people make the assumption that, well, you know, it's easy to detect because you've got centrifuges. They make the assumption that we're still going to be using World War II technology to develop uh, nuclear fuel for, for weapons, and that's not a good assumption. So an article I'll show you here from the GE website about global, global laser enrichment of nuclear fuel. You have to expect the technological advances are going to keep occurring in all fields. You know, just because we don't want to have more nuclear proliferation doesn't mean other people don't. So they're going to do research. Technology is constantly advancing. You have to expect that probably there's going to be some new ways found uh, to enrich uranium or some other fuel to make nuclear weapons. So between either a nuclear war or between a nuclear power plant act, your enterprise risk management plan needs to have some way to deal with radiation and with fallout. You need at a minimum, you know, Geiger counters, detection equipment, the ability to monitor radiation and exposure of people who are security guards or folks who are going to be more exposed. You have to have some plan to deal with that. You don't have to worry about what's exactly going to cause it. Just realize that a lot of incidents uh, could lead to that kind of situation. Another threat, if you're a public company that most people don't pay attention to is uh, terrorism designed to profit from put options or investments, uh, short selling your stock. Uh, this is an example from 911. A lot of people thought after 911 that Al Qaeda might have been trying to make money by shorting the stock of United Airlines or American Airlines. If you had invested just $10,000 in puts on these stock companies before 911, uh, your payoff would have been about $3 million. 
of the next day. So it'd make a lot of money you can make on this. This has happened in the past. Drug companies, for example, Smith Klein Beckman was a victim, a stockbroker, contaminated some of their product with rat poison. Then he went to the media to release it. We caught him. You know, he was a real idiot. Uh, but people could do this in a more sophisticated manner. And the problem is there's more and more derivative tradings, more and more volume going on, more and more types of derivative products that make it easier for more and more people to invest in this. So there's more room for their, them to hide, is what I'm saying, uh, to do these kinds of investments so it's harder for you to trace it back to them uh, to uncover them. And it's perfectly legal, you know, if you hear about someone doing it, for someone to make an investment. Uh, and there's also just a worry about the economic effects of derivatives on our stock market. You probably heard Warren Buffett. Uh, he's done a lot of warnings about um, you know, derivatives being instruments of financial mass destruction. And a lot of people think that, well, after 2008, we've fixed things. We haven't. We've had more violent moves in our stock market since 2008. Some of our worst trading days have been since then. It just continues to happen. The overall trends we see kind of summed up well on this slide. First of all, the destructive power of an individual has just skyrocketed, and it keeps going up. Whether you're talking about you know, a financial attack, sabotage, insider, or terrorist on your company to manipulate your stock and make money, uh, releasing a virus, uh, a cyber attack that shuts down the electrical system. There's just, it's easier now for a small individual or small group to cause destructive power that in the past, a nation state wouldn't have been able to do that to us. And when you combine that with the next trend, our increasing fragility of our economy, our dependence on just-in-time deliveries and those trucks rolling in every day, uh, we're just a lot more vulnerable and set up. And then you add to that the third part is that we're just not resilient like we're used to be. You know, unless you're a prepper who is well prepared for this or a farmer, you don't do well if there's not electricity and not those daily deliveries. So 98% of us aren't going to do well if there's any kind of a shutdown in economic activity and a lot of people are going to turn to lawlessness as a result. Worker absenteeism is a big issue. Most of you probably dealt with this in your pandemic plan and you got bad advice uh, from the government on your assumptions because they said you should assume up to 40% short-term worker absenteeism. And if you use that, I think you're in a bad way. Uh, it's not going to play out like that. If there's an avian flu pandemic and it's high lethality, I'm not coming to work. Uh, and most of your people are going to very quickly come out. They shouldn't come to work to risk it. It's not just me that's going to get killed if I come to work and get the virus. If I catch that virus and now I go home, now I've killed my family. So you're asking me to come to work to sacrifice my life. And oh, by the way, throw your family's life in there as well. People aren't going to do that. And that's just the virus. Now what if to get to work, I got to risk being mugged or shot uh, because there's widespread looting and violence. And there's no police around because they're trying to guard hospitals and pharmacies and you know, the mayor's office. I'm not coming to work. So you ask yourself, well, why did the government tell you to use this 40% example? And I've been searching for about 10 years now to try to find out where is this magical study that says that we could have up to 40% short-term absenteeism for workers during a pandemic? And the answer is, there is no study. There is no analysis. I have looked, I've questioned officials, I finally come up with, I think, I can't prove it, but I think is what is the explanation is. The answer is there was no study, so what they did is they had to come up with some number, so they found out that the Department of Defense, we do tons of exercises in the Department of Defense, the Department of Defense did a pandemic ex ex uh, exercise once, and they assumed up to 40% worker absenteeism. So one guy, in the military, you know, probably 10, 15 years ago, pulled this out of somewhere, and that's the number, and that's what they gave to you. Think about it. Ask yourself, ask your employees, think about a truck driver delivering food. Are you going to come to work? You have to be nuts. What I also did is we did a survey. We asked 100 people about worker absenteeism. Now, unfortunately, we asked it in a different manner. I'm graphing here percent that come to work. So absenteeism is, you know, is the inverse of that. And for police officers, people estimated about 60% would come to work. So that ended up actually hitting the 40% absenteeism number. But when I asked about truck drivers delivering food, most people assumed they would not come. And this is initially, a lot of people in our survey noted that over time, if things continue to get worse, more people will drop out. Plus, more people are going to die. So even if 60% of law enforcement come to work in a pandemic, what's going to happen to them? One, there's a good chance they're going to catch the virus and die or be sick and be done for. 
or they could get killed in, in the line of duty. Uh, so even if they want to come to work, there's going to be attrition for law enforcement from that. We also asked our question, what percent of Americans do you think would loot or maraud early on in this pandemic situation we described? The mean was 25% at the standard deviation there is pretty wide. On any of these, you know, no one knows. This is people's best guesstimates that they're giving us. But then we asked, if the pandemic continues and people are concerned that they might starve to death, would they loot? Uh, then it went up to 50% uh, would probably loot and maraud. Anyway, I just throw this out not because these are exact numbers that you can rely on. There is no numbers you can rely on. But I show it to you to say that if you think 40% short-term worker absenteeism is the right number to use for pandemic planning, I think you're smoking something and inhaling. So these are key, key questions for your organization to answer. Uh, quite a few of them, and most of you have already thought about it. First thing I think you ought to ask, and you ought to challenge uh, people in other parts of your company is, is this just-in-time delivery really worth it? Have we sat down to do the analysis of, you know, if we switch to have a month's supply of all our non-local source difficult to get ingredients, what would be the extra cost in our inventory and working capital? What would be the extra financial cost of that compared to this many days of being out of work, unable to work because we can't get it? There are incidents that happen all the time where one plant in Japan will have a fire and then U.S. plants shut down because they're the only one making that. You've done supply chain or risk management before. It's happened all the time. Or there's a strike in the Los Angeles port, and U.S. companies close down immediately because they don't have any inventory. So they're saving a little bit of money on lower working capital uh, interest costs, and now I'm out of production and I can't operate for days. That's a big loss. So you ought to challenge and ask for that analysis. It could be like my 40% absenteeism uh, study, or it doesn't exist. You ought to ask about that and question that, have people look into it. For rare earths, uh, yttrium, things like that, companies have learned the hard way that you don't do just-in-time delivery of that. China controls the supply, they can cut it off, and so you run into companies that have six months, a year supply uh, of rare earths that are obviously vulnerable to cut off, very easy to do. But you ought to look at that broadly in your firm, and I'll show you a technique to do that later on. You also have to have a shutdown plan. We're all about business continuity, but unless you're providing food or it's an essential service during a pandemic, you should probably have a, we're gonna shut down and we're not coming back, but we wanna shut down and if possible, secure our facilities. We wanna secure our plant, and we want to make sure our associates can survive this collapse period. And we've done consulting to help people with it. The good news is it's really not that expensive or difficult to do. Compared to your plans for IT recovery and backup and cyber defense, this is a piece of cake. Uh, it's easier and cheaper, so this is not a disastrous thing to do. And you need to worry about them. The other thing you want to look at, and this is there we've had you know, more enjoyable consulting engagements, is is there some other product or service that you could shift to during a pandemic or collapse situation, so you're producing something that they really need. I mean, a lot of you are producing stuff that you know, we're not gonna need during a collapse situation. No one's gonna be buying it, your customers aren't gonna be operating, but if there's a way you can shift to produce something else or provide some other service that would be needed during a collapse, one, you can potentially make some money, but perhaps more importantly, you can keep your associates going, keep people in the plant so it's not empty and you know, a target to be looted. So there's a lot of things like that that you need to consider and think about. The other thing is you can do investments and you make money from a collapse. And this is what Nassim Taleb does. Taleb says the best part of our brain, the best use of our brain, is to think about contingencies like black swans, who's gonna be impacted and how you could benefit. Uh, airlines, for example, if you're an international airline and there's a pandemic or any collapse situation, you're toast. Your business is going downhill. You won't be operating. You're going to have huge losses. So hedge funds, and I'll show you some of this on the next slide, they look for these kinds of things as they make investments in them and make a lot of money. So a lot of our companies, as I said, has helped companies identify ways that they can shift their operations, but also you can advise your, your investment department on how to invest uh, to take advantage of collapse situations when you see something coming and think there should be some defensive measures for it. Uh, last year in August, a hedge fund that Taleb advises made $1 billion in one day. 
because they'd anticipated a black swan event, they'd made the investment bets against it, and uh, they won big uh, when that occurred. So you can make money from it. The recent movie, The Big Short, again, it's a pretty good movie depicting what you have to do, buying your financial derivative products, you gotta wait it out. Everyone's gonna think you're an idiot because you're taking a contrarian position like they did in the movie, because uh, you are going against the norm. But when that norm changes fast and unexpectedly, you make a huge amount of money. That's what hedge funds do. So Talib in his book goes through 27 thinking errors that we commonly make in, in doing a poor job of analysis and risk assessment and preparing for black swan risk. We use these 27 errors in our training programs and our consulting to help people design processes that are better to overcome these biases. And we do a similar thing from the intelligence community. They've been doing this for decades, training analysts to avoid very common, very bad, sloppy thinking errors that all of us make. You all think that critical thinking is something, well, I just sit down, take out a piece of paper, and think carefully. You can't do that. Uh, by nature, you're going to make all kinds of simplifying assumptions. You won't even know you're making them. And you have to have a disciplined process. You have to have training. And you have to have checks. You have to have other groups that are looking for errors and watching for them. Red teaming is one example uh, that we use a lot in the military and in the intelligence community where we have another team. And our whole job is to shoot holes in your analysis, find errors in your thinking, you always do. And you need to have a process like that. The other thing you need to set up is a technology watch program. Again, does the Pentagon do this? You better believe it. We're always looking at new technologies and how they might be used to cause trouble so we can take countermeasures and be prepared for them. You can do it, and probably if you're in a big firm, other people in your firm are doing some aspect. If you've got a research and development department, we've found clients who've already got part of the technology watch program. They just didn't know about it, and they were able to piggyback on it to add some issues of concern for them to watch out for. Some people just outsource a technology watch to us. There are a lot of books and, as I said, training programs on this. Hedge funds are really the best at it because they have the ability to make a lot of money by betting on black black swan events, anticipating uh, changes that the market isn't going to see, but they do and they invest in. There's some other resources you can get into. How many people are familiar with industry information sharing and analysis centers? Does anyone belong? There's one over there. Anyone else belong to an ISAC information sharing and analysis center? You got to write this down. All of you should find out, if I can flip the slide. Uh, if your industry has one, there are 19 industry information sharing and analysis centers. This site is for the financial services one. I've worked with them. It's a fantastic resource. InfraGuard has come up several times in this conference. That's a good group. This is also a fantastic resource for you. They do threat watch. They do best practices and trading ideas on how to prepare for threats. This is a good group to, to join. I do need to warn you, the financial services ISAC is fantastic. Some of these others are not very good. Uh, they're not as active, but you ought to check it out and see if there's an ISAC that you can join and be involved with. This is another really, really important lesson learned for you here. You've all done this. You've used this risk matrix. I categorize my risks by their probability of current and their consequences, and I define critical risks as those that are high impact and high probability. Stop doing that. It's a disastrous idea because it makes you vulnerable to black swan threats. What you do is you say, oh, a pandemic, what's the probability of that? I don't know, so what am I gonna do? It hasn't happened recently. I'm gonna sign it a low probability and I'm gonna ignore it. So you tell me that when a lot of your associates are killed in the pandemic and your business is looted and you're destroyed, that's not a critical risk because you couldn't estimate the probability of a pandemic, so you put it in low. You've all done this. I've done it. I'll guarantee you, most of you in this room have done this. Stop doing it. It sets you up for black swan disaster. This is a very bad practice. You should define critical risk as if it's a high impact and it's at all feasible, it's a critical risk. You need to be prepared for it. Pandemics, EMP events, long-term electrical outages, all those. We think nuclear war isn't gonna happen. You know, probability zero. Well, that's what they thought in the 1930s and 40s up until it happened. We thought with tons of nuclear weapons on both sides it wouldn't happen. It almost happened in 1963 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. People tell us, the experts, that the probably nuclear war is rising now because there's nuclear proliferation going on, there's unstable countries with nuclear weapons, and there's new technologies to make nuclear fuel that are going to come out there, and bigger, more capable terrorist groups that can likely get a hold of one. You need to be prepared to deal with radiation events. 
So what do you do if you can't calculate the probability, but your boss says, I don't care, I'm not going to deal with this unless I know it's something that could happen. Well, don't estimate it slow. Never ever do that. You could refuse to estimate the probability, but they may keep saying you've got to have one. You could do a worst case estimate. I wouldn't do that because as soon as you label it worst case, they're going to ignore it. So what we do is we interview subject matter experts to get probability estimates or guesstimates, if you will, and we insist on a range, a high-low estimate range. We have to speed up here to cover all this in my remaining time. And we've developed, uh, advanced analysis applications developed a collapse probability model where we take the probability of that disaster event, high and low, and then we ask, is this likely to be a big event? You know, if it's just small and local, it's probably not going to spread. This is going to have a wide impact. And then what's the probability that it's going to escalate out of control to shut down the economy or loss of law and order? Now, before someone says, well, isn't this hypocritical? You just said you can't calculate the probability, and here you are doing probabilities. And so I will confess, yes, this is hypocritical, uh, but we have to do it because people insist on probabilities. But we get around it by we caveat that, hey, there's no valid Statistically way, statistical way to do this. We have high and low ranges, and we stress it's just an estimate. It could probably be much worse. Anyway, we track 45 different trigger event categories. Our estimates from interviewing people is that the probability of a collapse in this year ranges from 1 to 21 percent, and it's going up. We track 45 trigger events, probabilities are rising in 39 out of the 45, mainly because most of them are technology driven, plus a lot of them are kind of population dependent, and there's just our population is getting more and more vulnerable uh, to collapse disaster situations. Next thing I want to cover is this multi-criteria decision analysis scorecard. This is what we use when we're trying to help clients estimate what is the best mitigation measures to, uh, to uh, pursue and how do you make them robust, meaning they cover a lot of threats and cost effective. Now you would never do in a presentation what I'm doing right now where you show a whole big scorecard like this because uh, people can't read it and it looks uh, it looks overwhelming. It's actually quite simple. I'm just showing you now the upper left hand corner. In the rows, I've listed my different options for addressing my different threat situations. For example, hardened heavy-duty steel doors, uh, replacing all our doors with heavy-duty steel doors. Now I'm going to compare them across a wide variety of threats. I'm going to go back one. Both impacts on different risks, and then I want to look at what's the feasibility of me implementing these different measures, and then what's the cost. And costs are both dollars and staff time and general disruption to operations. So I compare against a wide variety of criteria. I rate them on different scales. Those little numbers in red are weights. I could put more weights on things I think are more important. This software runs in Excel. It's very easy to use. It's add, subtract, multiply, divide. But it's very powerful. Uh, we've used it in all kinds of engagements. I've briefed General Petraeus in Iraq using this, CEOs, and it always goes over very well. Again, you've got to present it in more than a couple minutes like I'm doing here. But when you walk people through it and you show them your analysis and how you've considered the implementation difficulties and the costs, the other big benefit is when you're going through this process of developing these risk mitigation measures is you're going to have disagreements. So you do sensitivity analysis. Someone thinks that the staff guard training and weapons is going to have a big impact. They rate it high. Someone else says, no, it's not going to make any difference at all. They rate it low. You plug in the numbers and you see, does your final total score change? And the other thing we do when we're doing this is we often find that you find one measure looks really good in this area, but not in others. This one is kind of a good complement to it. You can often combine the two. You modify some of your options. You come up with much more cost-effective methods. Usually when we come in, people have anywhere from 20 to 40 ideas of what they want to do. We end up finding four or five more that are combinations or variants of them, and they usually end up being the ones that score the best. So we develop better mitigation options. Doing it. Another really, really good benefit of this is you're always going to have some people who disagree on something. But what's neat about this is I can totally disagree on a number here. I can plug in the different numbers. When you have that many criteria to consider and you change the numbers on that, your overall weighted score that you see on the far end, it doesn't change much. So we can say, you two here disagree on something, it doesn't matter. Despite your disagreement, you still all believe that option number one is the best and you, don't, and you move on. It's a fantastic tool. You can use it for all kinds of things. This is a more difficult tool. This is a Bayesian belief network. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. We mentioned red teaming. We also do strategic war games to help companies um, develop better strategies. 
And it's like a tabletop exercise only. This is a two to three day exercise. You play it in future time and you have competing teams. So for example, this is an example of ConAgra Food Company. We had Hormel and Tyson and different food companies. So now when I come up with an idea as my company, other people are coming up with different ideas and they compete in this future marketplace. This was such a big event for us that a ConAgra CEO featured it in our annual plan and we made all kinds of changes in our strategy to result from it. Now you guys aren't going to be able to get your company to invest a million dollars or more to do a war game, but what you can do, what we've had clients do is go to their corporate strategy and planning department, convince them to do a war game, and then you tag onto it. So what you'll do is you'll inject a pandemic or an EMP, loss of electricity event, in the war game so you get some of your benefit out of. It's a great tool. Uh, and, a, and a really neat one. Again, the government isn't going to prepare you. This is a conference I was at. That's me on the far right. This guy on the left was a congressman. He was trying to get Congress to invest in EMP hardening of utilities because when there's an EMP event, our electric grid is going down. Uh, he didn't succeed. When he didn't succeed, he eventually left office. He's a congressman from Maryland, but now he lives in West Virginia. Why does he live in West Virginia? Because you don't want to be in Maryland uh, during a collapse. You don't want to be in an urban area. Uh, a lot of people think that preppers are, are nutcases and survivalists, and you think of doomsday preppers. That congressman is a prepper. I'm a prepper. A lot of people who are aware of threats uh, were preppers. Most preppers don't talk about being preppers. How many of you know Ted Koppel? He used to be a night, Nightline anchor. He's probably one of the most uh, highly regarded journalists of our times. He was interviewed recently in Time magazine warning about cyber attacks on our electrical infrastructure that's so fragile. And it could take down our power system for months, potentially over a year, depending on how much other demand there is for getting the replacement parts. He warned that the Department of Homeland Security has no plans for this kind of attack. And he also said, and I'm going to quote here, I see no indication that Homeland Security is in the process of developing such a plan. What Koppel recommended is that people have at least a three-month supply of stockpiled food, not this ridiculous government three-day guideline. And Koppel also recommended that people change their attitudes uh, towards prepping. Stop thinking that survivalists are not even militiamen. There are some of them. They get the publicity. Uh, but most of them are very serious people who are taking very sensible steps to be prepared as individuals. And what you need to do is to make sure it's happening with your company. Did Congress take any action on this? No. Why not? Because forcing the utility companies to harden means they spend billions of dollars, your electrical rates go up. What's in it for congressmen? Do I get any pork out of that? Do I get any extra votes? Didn't happen. A key part of our consulting engagement is often helping you developing a convincing pitch to convince your CEO to select these, to, uh, to adopt some of your risk mitigation measures. And yes, as you know, it's, it's not an easy sale. But when you lay out the case, you show them the threats, you show them the experts, and then you go through that multi-criteria decision analysis scorecard to explain how, look, we've looked at a wide variety of measures. We didn't select really expensive ones. We picked ones that are feasible. We picked robust measures that address a whole range of threats. And that's the good news from all this. Most risk mitigation measures for an EMP event are also going to help you in other events. Whatever the trigger is, if it results in a shutdown in economic activity or a loss in law and order, it's the same basic mitigation measures to protect your plant and to protect your associates. And it's not difficult like IT backup and cybersecurity. So you can generally do it. A good example is 911. If you had done a $100 security bar on the cockpit door and had a policy that you lock your door during in flight, 911 wouldn't have happened. $100 mitigation measure would have, would have stopped that for us. You all do exercises. They don't have to be boring. They can actually be fun. It doesn't have to be like this, you know, death by PowerPoint uh, with 50 slides in 50 minutes or computer-based learning. You can do fun exercises. They're coming out now to where you can do them with phone apps. You can involve people where they get messages of events unfolding, and you can get a lot of people involved, make it interesting and enjoyable. So my bottom line conclusions are up here. A viral pandemic is inevitable, but there's a lot of other things that could trigger a collapse and the collapse and the loss of law and order may be the biggest threat to you and your enterprise risk management plan needs to address that. You need to be prepared for that. 
You know, Warren Buffett is up here in a quote telling you that the CEO should regard his top job as the chief risk officer, but that's been delegated to you. You all are the watchdogs, and it's your job to protect the herd, to keep them safe if there's a viral pandemic or a loss of electricity. And it's not an easy job, as you know. We all think that Churchill, before World War II, was a hero and popular for giving his warnings about Nazi Germany and the threat and calling for preparations. That's not true. Uh, Churchill was actually ridiculed, and he was ignored. They didn't pay attention to him. But you have to succeed in convincing people that there are real threats out there, there's big risk of lawlessness and a collapse, and you have to be prepared for it. So it's a tough job, but it's your responsibility to make sure that your associates, is protect, your associates are protected and your organization is recovered from any kind of a collapse situation. And we move on to questions. Again, you can email me if you want the color slides or the uh, Nassim Taleb uh, Black Swan Cliff Notes. I don't want to read the book. I covered a lot, but happy to answer questions on any of these topics. Yes, sir. So essentially with your scenario, uh, I've been working with our company tox toxicologists and uh, rewriting and getting out of the pandemic plan mindset and looking at public threat plans. And uh, with a three-level escalation, um, essentially I should go back to my toxicologists and say, you know, throw this all out. If something happens, we should just all pack up and go home. Uh, depending on your company, I mean, if you're a clothing designer firm, I would pack up and go home. On the other hand, if you can switch to sell some product or service, you might want to do it. But do you want your associates to just go home if they're not prepared? Do you want to work on plans to help your associates survive at home? Do you want to worry about protecting your facility at all? We make gas. So essentially, I would make push. what? We, we make gas. We're a refiner. Okay. So essentially, I've been pushing for the concept of okay, complete isolation immediately with trailers so you have ships that are rotating and not interacting, and then also looking at how do we uh, provide a certain level of safety for those families so you can focus on work and be there, maybe that's the families, but not interacting back and forth with the public. And there's been a little bit of laughter, but taking from what you say, that's kind of the only way that we can ensure that we're making gaps. Yeah. If you want to have guards at your facility and they've got a family, you pretty much need to have their family at your facility. Otherwise, they're going to go home to take care of their family. So those are issues that we consult and deal with people on because you've got to consider about them. And again, if you can operate during the company, it's good for your company, but it's also maybe the best thing for your associates. Otherwise, I've got to protect themselves at home, which may not be feasible, or their commute in may be too unsafe to do. So it, there is no one formula for everything, but you have to consider your associates at home and their families as well as your work facilities. But again, it's not usually that expensive. An oil refinery, that's a little more soft, high explosive target. Uh, most of us don't have that much trouble. Any other questions? Thank you all. You got my email up there if you want the Cliffs Notes or any other questions, and uh, appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Dr. Drew, this is a little gift. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was uh, sobering. Fascinating stuff, though. Got a couple of announcements before I send you out here for your, uh, for your break. Uh, first of all, uh, you must wear your badge for, at all times for uh, the, the meals and any of the uh, uh, conference functions. Uh, do as I say, not as I do. I don't have it on right now. All the evaluation forms are located in your conference book and on the mobile app. Please make sure you, you do fill those out. Speaker evaluations, you'll find them in the back of the conference book uh, and on the app if you're using it. Uh, attendance certificates, if you have a question about that, they will be emailed to you after the conference. It may take one to two weeks. The UPS store will be open today from uh, until 3 p.m. Uh, at uh, Sonora A, so go there. 
Uh, your luggage tags, don't forget to pick those up at the uh, registration desk. Uh, those not picked up, they're going to get rid of. So with that, uh, there'll be a short break. You'll be back here for 10.30 and then the prize drawing.